Dr. Mary Ruhr has worked in, works in uh, the medical research industry for 20 years. Uh, she's the author of Healing Our World in an Age of Regression and tough an uh, Short Answers to Tough Questions. And uh, she'll be speaking on the, the only solution to healthcare crisis. So. Well, thank you for that very warm welcome. I really appreciate it. And I'm here to talk about a subject that is hot in the news and that libertarians have the only solution to. I guess there's many topics like that, but my favorite one is health care. That's because I was in the industry so long. And, and actually still am to a large extent. So let's get started and find out why libertarians have the only solution. You know, if you think about it, there are... There are a lot of things going on right now that if you're not in the healthcare industry or you haven't had a loved one uh, die of a terminal disease, you might not be aware of. I have had that misfortune, and I can tell you that even private health care today is rationed. What happens is that if you're not at your loved one's bedside 24-7, you don't always get the treatment you want because there is such a demand on the medical personnel that they just can't service everybody the way they'd like. Okay, I'm not loud enough, okay. And so now what's happening, of course, the things that many people are aware of is that there is rationing in the government paid programs too. Many doctors are refusing to accept Medicare patients anymore because Medicare does not reimburse the physicians. And the VA is turning away veterans if they have income that the VA considers sufficient to pay their own medical bills. So a lot of rationing is already starting to happen. And that is because health care costs are so high, nobody can pay for them. The government can't pay for them, private individuals can't pay. So what we really need to do is bring down the health care costs without sacrificing quality. Now, there are a lot of people who talk about the runaway litigation, and that really accounts for maybe 5 to 10% of the health care costs, the excess litigation costs. And then a lot of people talk about the fact that so much of our medical care is paid for by third parties, like insurance or government. And yes, that is a factor. That maybe accounts for about 20% of the waste. But the big factor that very few people talk about is regulation. And the reason they don't talk about it is unless you're in the industry, you probably don't see it. But regulation is prominent at every aspect of health care. And it's kind of hard to get your, your hands on in some ways because a lot of it's done at the state level. Let me give you an example. First of all, I want to impress upon you that these regulations are not stagnant. They're set up in a way that they increase every year almost automatically. There's a lot of leeway given to licensing boards, for example, and every state has one for doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel, and they pretty much have carte blanche to change things as they see fit. Um, similar with hospital regulations and insurance mandates, which keep increasing. So these are all regulated pretty much at the state and local level, so they're kind of hard to get a handle on because they're so numerous. It's a little different with pharmaceutical regulation, which is what I'm going to mostly talk about today as an example. Everything I talk about in the pharmaceutical uh, regulation happens on the local level. But the reason I'm going to talk about pharmaceuticals is it happens at the national level. And so it's more uniform. When it changes, it changes in very discrete increments so we can actually measure the effect. And I want to measure the effect for that because it really constitutes somewhere between 50 and 90 percent of our health care costs. It's a big one. If we want to cut back on health care costs and make it affordable, we have to cut regulation. There is no other way. If we keep on like we are, already no one can afford it, and pretty soon no one will get it. So that would be a very bad situation. So to start, I'm going to talk about the 1962 Kefauver-Harris Amendments. Now, don't be intimidated by the graphs I show. They're going to be pretty simple, and I'll walk you through. These regulations, which I have indicated up here, 
were passed in the wake of the thalidomide tragedy. It was the biggest drug tragedy of the time. It happened in Europe, not much in the US because the drug wasn't available here. And what it was, it was a replacement for barbiturate sleeping pills. It was much safer than barbiturates, but it wasn't safe for pregnant women to take because it affected the baby's development. They were born without arms and legs. I know many of you, I can see, are old enough to remember this, as I am. It's, it was pretty terrifying at the time. And it scared people, even in the US. And there were regulations, these Kefauver Harris regulations had been languishing in Congress for three years before this, and they were hastily passed to reassure the American public that this wouldn't happen to them. Well, these regulations would not have prevented the thalidomide tragedy, but they created an American thalidomide tragedy, which I'm going to talk about later, that was almost invisible to the American people. They really, really backfired. And one of the ways in which they backfired is they increased the time it took for a pharmaceutical manufacturer to take a brand new drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. Here you can see in blue that between 1948 and 1961, it took about four and a half years for a new drug to make it from the lab bench to the marketplace. After the amendments were passed, you can see the impact in brown. Every year, the regulations were increasing the time of development until by 2000, it was about 14 to 15 years. Now, think about it. If you have a terminal illness, can you wait 14 or 15 years for a new drug? Of course not. And when the AIDS uh, epidemic hit, I was working in the early years of that, and the AIDS patients decided they didn't have time to wait. So they broke the law. They contracted with black market chemists to make the drugs that we were working on in the pharmaceutical industry. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to test these drugs in people, every AIDS patient in the country that wanted them had already had them because they got them through their black market chemists. And they had a pretty good safety record. They actually talked to each other, distributed the drugs in a pretty safe way. And if you want to learn more, it's quite an interesting story. I highly recommend Quitney's book, Acceptable Risks. Now, the FDA did not go after the AIDS patients, and the pharmaceutical companies did not go after them either, even though they were violating patent laws by making these drugs. And of course, I think that was a good thing, obviously. These are sick people. But had they gone after them, it would have made it clear to everyone that the FDA is really delaying getting life-saving drugs to market. And this might have caused some reform. So I guess it was kind of a two-edged sword. Well, the cancer patients didn't want to go that route. They wanted to be legal. So what they did is they lost. And how they went about this is they, they sued the FDA because they said that they had the constitutional right to save their own lives by buying drugs from the pharmaceutical companies that had been tested in humans but hadn't yet been shown to be effective. First safety testing happens, so that had been done, but Effectiveness testing follows after that. So uh, what they did is they sued, and they won in one court, lost in, and lost in the other, and they tried to take it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to hear the case, and so the lower court ruling stood. There is no such constitutional right. We do not have the constitutional right to try to save our lives with unapproved drugs. Yeah, that was kind of unpopular with the cancer patients, as you might imagine. And I really believe this is, that, this is just the first round. I think this is going to come back to haunt the courts. I believe this will continue, not in this particular case, but I think it's going to continue, especially as our population ages and more and more people want access to these drugs. But this is, this is how it goes. Now, we can actually calculate, believe it or not, we can actually get a pretty good idea of how many people lost their lives or had their lives shortened by the FDA simply because of this delay in drug development. And the reason we can do that is we have a pretty good idea of how many lives are saved by the drugs that were put on the market up to about the year 2000. And when we do this calculation, we find that there are, let's see if I can get my pointer to work, 
4.7 million lives lost due to the delays. Now, you can argue with this number a little bit, you know, say maybe the estimate was off a little bit, but you can see the number is big. And how big is it? How does it compare to the number of lives that might have been saved by the regulations? Well, we know that information too. And the reason we know it is we know how many drug tragedies we had before 1962. So we can get a feel for how many people would have survived if they had been able to um, you know, have these regulations in place. And if we're very conservative and say that we could have prevented every drug problem, every, every side effect that happened before 1962 with these new regulations, which of course we can't, but let's just assume that to give the FDA the benefit of the doubt, we would probably have about saved about 7,000 lives during the same time these 4.7 million lost their lives. Now again, one can argue about that number, but it's got to be a thousand times off to compare to this 4.7 million lives lost. So as you can see, it appears that the FDA is killing more people than it saves. I have a cartoon in Healing Our World that kind of describes the situation. Um, here we have the guns of government keeping the new therapies from you know, people who are terminal or wheelchair bound and telling them that their disease may kill them before these life-saving drugs are available, but at least they'll die safe. And of course, there is no safety for someone who's terminally ill. That's why this is so, um, I would say hilarious, but it's so tragic that actually that word doesn't apply. It is very, very sad when we have very sick people that are willing to take the chance that something might work for them and thereby give us great information about the new drugs. They're willing to take that chance because they don't have any other chance. So this is very sad. Now, as you might imagine, this lengthening of 10 years on development time, you know, the difference between four and a half years to 14 and a half years, costs a lot of money. And once again, don't worry about the graph here. It's actually pretty simple. Basically, on the, uh, my laser pointer is failing me here. Basically, on what we call the y-axis, uh oh, hang on. <laughs> ah. It's a new computer. I haven't trained it yet. <laughs> OK. So basically, here we go. On the y-axis, we have the research and development cost for each what we call new chemical entity or new drug uh, in $2,003. And down here, we have the median year of approval. As you can see, before the amendments were passed, between 1950 and 1960, regulations were already increasing the cost of drug development, but it was pretty low. If we extrapolate out into this area, you know, we'd see it's about here. But if we look at what happened after the amendments, you see how steeply the cost increase became, and it's still rising. And if you look at the difference between over here and over here, you can see where the increase in the drug costs at your pharmacy come from. So, oops. And basically, this is just a graph showing you that there's not, not surprising for any libertarian, there's a direct correlation between how much we have to spend at the drugstore and how much the manufacturers have to pay in research and development for their new drugs. It's, you know, a very uh, strict correlation. Well, based on these graphs, you can actually calculate, oops, ah! Yes, uh, oops, wrong one. Yes, if the pre-amendment trends had continued, pharmaceutical prices would be about 15% of what they are today. That's a huge number. Now remember, everything I'm saying about the pharmaceutical industry pretty much applies to the medical industry too. It's just harder to put those all together because there's multiple regulations there as we talked about before. And of course, there's 
I haven't even really touched on, this is the scary part, I haven't told you the bad news yet. <laughs> I've only started. The delay is only part of it. A bigger problem is the loss of innovation. And I'm underestimating the loss of innovation. Here I'm saying that the loss of innovation is about half because the manufacturers have to shift from doing research to doing development. In other words, instead of discovering new drugs, they have to satisfy these regulations. So that's what they, they do. They spend their money that way. Now, this, this figure of 50% actually is very low because what it represents is the number of drugs that are stopped just before they go to ask FDA for approval because the manufacturer realizes late in the game it's already cost them so much, there's no way they're going to recover costs even if they market this thing. So they drop it. Totally economic reasons. And you know, a lot more drop out even before that because before any drug goes into development, the MBAs get together in the company and they say, okay, let's figure out how much it's going to cost us to develop this. Nope, we're never going to be able to recover these costs. We won't do it. I'll give you a real life example to show you how bad this is. I had an FDA examiner call me up one day and they said, Dr. Ruart, we're all excited. We understand you just filed a patent for the treatment of liver disease with prostaglandins. I said, yes, I did. They said, that's fantastic. There is no way to treat liver disease. We want to help you get this drug to market. Well, of course I'm going, ah, oh, finally. <laughs> but you know, even with the FDA doing everything they could, it wasn't going to work. Do you know why? When you have a new breakthrough drug, you don't know how to do the study to show the effectiveness. For example, in liver disease, what do we measure? A parameter in the blood? Do we take a biopsy of the liver to look at it? How long do we have to treat the people? It took a long time for their liver to become fibrotic and cirrhotic. How long is it going to take them to cure them? And what dose of the drug do we have to use? And if we do this study, which is going to take us years, and we haven't guessed right on all those answers, the, what we call the statistical significance won't be good enough for the FDA. And if it's not, we have to start all over again. And by then, our patent's gone. And if we don't have a patent, we can't recover our costs. So my company decided not to develop prostaglandins for liver disease, even though we had the support of the FDA. Pushing. Yeah. That's how bad it is. Now, if you think about it, and, and this is something that... Uh, you know, a researcher in this area, Warden Wardell, said, he said, if even one new drug of the stature of penicillin or digitalis has been unjustifiably banished into a company's back shelf because of excessively stringent regulation, that event will have harmed more people than all the toxicity that has ever occurred in the history of modern drug development. And he's right. He's right, because a life-saving drug saves so many lives compared to the number of side effects that one normally would see. So it's really a big tragedy not to have innovation, and you can kind of calculate both in lives lost and in money, depending on how effective you think these lost innovations would be uh, compared to current ones. For example, if you think they'd be just as effective as the current drugs, that's 16 million people. 16 million people that had their lives shortened because these innovations weren't on the market. If you think they're only a quarter of as effective, that's another 4.1 million. So you see this far exceeds probably the impact of drug delay. And remember, these are conservative estimates. It's also true that it costs a lot in money. You know, when you think in 2003, the health care expenditures were 16 billion, uh, six, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 1,600 billion, and you look at the billions here that it's costing us for loss of innovation, you can, you can pretty quickly figure out that about 25 to 55% of our health care costs are due to loss of innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. And remember, other types of health care regulation have this impact too. Now you can start to see why health care is so expensive today and why deregulation is truly the only solution. 
So let me get a little review here before we go on, and I give you the, the worst news, because I've just gotten started. Um, <laughs> these amendments in the pharmaceutical industry account for about 85% of current pharmaceutical costs. They kill at least 100 times more people than they save. The real number is probably closer to 1,000. Again, I'm being conservative. And they've probably doubled the current health care costs. And I just want to give you kind of an example of why that happens. You know, when the first um, anti-ulcer drug, Tagamet, came on the market, it was very expensive. It cost about $2,000 for two, two one-year terms of it. That was a lot of money back then, because this was back in the, uh, well, I think it was back in the early 80s. But if you didn't have that, what was your option? Surgery. You were out of work. You had to have a $25,000 surgery. And, of course, you had all of the side effects of a surgery, which sometimes they can't quite put you back together right. So you can see why it is so important to have a, a drug instead of surgery or other treatment if you can get it. So that's why the health care cost burden is so high when you don't have innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. But here's the biggie that I have really no good way to estimate, but I think you'll see pretty quickly that is the most important part of the Kefauver Harris amendments and what they did to our what was going to be our golden age of health care. Treatment, not prevention, became the norm. Basically, the Kefauver Harris amendments outlawed prevention. And let's talk about that a little bit. Um, first of all, I guess I want to explain to you how important prevention is. Before the advent of genetic manipulation, in the olden days of pharmaceutical research, the way we made our animals sick was to take away their vitamins. There was nothing else we could do. Our rats were so healthy, they didn't get sick. Yes, they did die of old age eventually, but you know, if you were looking for diabetic rats or, or obese rats or things like that, it was a little difficult because the rats were pretty smart. You know, rats won't drink alcohol unless you take all their food and water away and only give them uh, um, a chocolate shake with alcohol in it. Chocolate is the only thing that will induce them uh, to drink alcohol. You can put alcohol in their water and they will thirst to death rather than drink it. So, you know, it, they're very smart. Anyhow, bottom line though is the way we made our animals sick was to take away a vitamin or two and then they would develop the diseases that we were trying to treat. Now this is kind of a little hint you know, that maybe these diseases were caused by not having enough nutrition. But the reason that never caught on is that at the time of the Kefauver Harris amendments, most of the vitamin and nutrition research was actually being done at the drug companies. They were actually synthesizing the vitamins so there was enough to, uh, for people to take on a regular basis, and they were the first ones to put out the one-a-day multiple vitamins and things of that nature. Now, they were low potency compared to what we get today, but they were, they were pioneering this. And when the Kefauver Harris amendments came along and demanded that you showed effectiveness, they quickly realized that they were going to anger the FDA if they tried to make claims for their one-a-day multiple vitamins. You know, oh, these will help keep you healthy. Well, that's a drug claim according to the FDA. And if you don't go through all these regulatory hoops, you can't say that. So they had to make a choice, pharmaceuticals or nutritionals. And they, of course, made the, the only choice they really could have, which was the pharmaceuticals. So when they went into the doctor's offices to tell the doctors about new drugs, they couldn't tell them, well, you know, your pa patients can take vitamin E instead of the drug we're offering because it works just as well. If they did, they would have been violating the law. But in fact, that's exactly what happened. I remember I was on a plane one time, and I had a gentleman sitting next to me, and he said, hey, I hear your company's developing these compounds called Lazaroids, named after Lazarus, the biblical Lazarus rising from the dead, because these compounds were doing such wonderful things. And I, he said, can you get me some of these? I said, well, you know, they're not on the market yet. I'll check with the project manager and see what we can do. The project manager said, no, we can't give out this drug even on a compassionate use protocol right now, but just tell them to take lots of vitamin E. It does the same thing. <laughs> so why are we developing this expensive drug 
when we could give people vitamin E because we're not allowed to tell them about vitamin E. And if we brought them through this big process of drug development, what would have happened was every other company could do it because it wasn't protected by patents, so we couldn't recover our costs, so it doesn't make economic sense. So that's one of the, the problems. And that's really sad because I think a lot of our diseases today probably are nutritionally based. And with proper nutrition, we'd probably save lots of money. I can't calculate how much quite yet, but uh, as you can see, it's probably big. And, you know, the FDA, the reason the FDA can get away with this is they say that the First Amendment does not protect commercial speech. Really. And this has been challenged in the courts, and the FDA has been told that it has to allow claims for some nutritionals, but they haven't obeyed the court. They've been hauled back into court, and this has gone on for some time. Well, one enterprising company said, well, you know what, fish oil is so important, I think we're going to give it a whirl. I think we're going to go ahead and jump through some of these regulatory hoops because cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. I think we can sell enough of this stuff. So they did. You can now get prescription fish oil. The copay for prescription fish oil cost as much as if you went to the store and bought the same thing from your nutritional supplier. That's just the copay. So that means your insurance company is paying another nine times that. Another reason why healthcare costs are so high. But what this manufacturer now can do is it is legal for them to go to the doctors and say, our fish oil is the only one approved by the FDA for cardiovascular disease. And the doctors will buy into this and prescribe this because they don't have much nutritional training. Our doctors do not get much nutritional training, and that is because of the licensing laws surrounding physicians. So you can kind of see how this stuff starts to overlap. Okay, so what can we do about this, and, and where are we going with this? Well, one of the things that's happening is there is the Health Care Freedom Act, uh, the Health Freedom Act, um, H.R. 2117 that was proposed by Ron Paul, and that would allow nutritional claims for supplements and things of that nature as long as there was some scientific evidence, some. Because, of course, the FDA doesn't care for the evidence that's there, and they rule it out. <laughs> so that's a good thing, but it hasn't passed yet. So I just wanted to make you aware of that in case you're looking for a way to do something about this. So I just want to conclude and say that excess regulation, and I'm calling regulation, excess is, well, just about everything, because, but I'm going to define it here as regulation that harms instead of helps. And with that definition, that probably wipes out almost every regulation on the books. And it's largely responsible for the soaring health care costs. And cutting out this regulation is the only way, truly the only way, that we are going to be able to reduce health care costs without compromising quality. Anything else we do is going to compromise quality by rationing or some other method. It just isn't going to be available. And sadly, most people don't know. Now, most drug development happens in the United States. So when drug development here is curtailed, when innovation slows, this ripples out to the rest of the world. It doesn't just kill Americans. It kills people in other countries, too. And this, this is very bad. So one of the things I want to leave with you is that what happens here doesn't just stay here, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. It does ripple out. And remember that I'm only talking about one aspect of the healthcare industry right now, because the others all the occupational licensing and the, the insurance licensing, the uh, insurance regulations that happen, that also has an impact. And that accounts for a lot of the problems, too. Libertarians have the only solution to the health care crisis, deregulation. That is the message I want you to take back with you, because you are the only ones that are going to be out there talking about it. And so far, we haven't done a very good job. So what I'm hoping is that this presentation helps you understand what's going on, helps you convey it to the people that you are aware of um, that are concerned about this, and hopefully 
because we're going to have a big crisis in health care with all the baby boomers retiring, we will be able to come forward and put forth a solution that actually works, not just for the American people, but the world. Thank you. I guess I'm going to take questions. Do you want to pick people and bring them, Mike? You go ahead and, and do that. That'll be easy. And I'm going to try to get a sip of water. <laughs> Can you speak to how patents affect the healthcare care industry, um, not so much the regulation government end of it? Yes, well, there have been some studies. Uh, the question was about patents. How does it affect the healthcare industry? Um, there's been some studies done on patents and how they affect different industries. And interestingly enough, the ones that are affected the most positively by patent protection are the ones that are the most heavily regulated, which shouldn't surprise anybody because back when I started, we didn't care if we had patents or not <laughs> because it, that wasn't important. It was only as the regulations increased that it made it necessary to have a patent. So patents are sort of a, in my opinion, um, it's kind of a status band-aid to put on a status problem. I mean, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't need patents um, if we didn't have all this regulation. So I think they would fade. The other industry that's uh, heavily influenced by patent protections, the chemical industry, another heavily regulated industry. Um, when these amendments passed, there were a lot of problems. I, I, I'm not able to show you everything. I'm writing a book on this, actually. That's how big of a topic it is. But what happened after these amendments passed is the new drugs that were, you know, like up in the stratosphere in the beginning, after 62, all of a sudden there was almost no new drugs. And then in 1980, they changed the patent law so that universities could patent their inventions. Before 1980, if it was done with public money, they couldn't patent it. And therefore, it couldn't be developed anymore because the regulations made it too onerous. Once they did that, though, then they could have new drugs because they could partner with the university. So that's the impact. So I have the question. Um, I think the patent window right now is like 17 years or something. How long do you think it's going to take before the um, testing and R&D window overtakes the patent window and you practically can't uh, patent a, a particular medication. Yeah, actually that's, that I think is happening now. The question is, you know, when is the patent life going to be short enough that you can't recover your costs? And actually the effective patent life is only about 10 or 11 years. And that's because when a company discovers a new drug, it files the patent right away then starts the development process, and you know, about halfway through the development process, they're granted the patent. So the patent clock is ticking already as they continue development. So by the time they get it to market, they don't have much time left. And I think that that's coming up. Right now, the companies are struggling. They don't have new innovations because it's too expensive to do something new. Um, you know, I was telling you about the liver disease problem. When you have something new, you have additional challenges. In fact, it's hard to develop a compound that isn't going to be used chronically now because you can't recover costs. We're already in that place where the companies are just tweaking the compounds a little bit and doing me too's because they know they can get approval. And it's just going to break down. That whole system is going to break down. And the, the threat, I'll say, the threat that faces the FDA is that a lot of people are trying to go around the problems with making claims for nutritionals and supplements. It's getting very hard to tell what's a supplement and what's, what's what. So once, and, and there's a big libertarian movement, I have to tell you, this is if you aren't engaged in the nutritional and supplement areas, you need to be because the activists are there. Congress got more mail over the FDA trying to take over nutritionals than any other issue. And it happened twice, twice. These are the activists, and they're ours. The leaders of this movement are ours. They're over libertarians. You know, so we need to be coordinating with these people, <laughs> getting them in here. So once that happens, there is not going to be an effective FDA, because think about it. If you can make a claim for a nutritional without having to jump through all these regulatory hoops, 
who's going to want to be giving people chemicals with all these side effects, you know? It's, it's not going to happen. So I think the system's going to break down, especially with the baby boomers. Let me share one other thing that the FDA is doing, because I'm, I'm very hot on this. Adult stem cell research. Um, they now know how to take the stem cells out of your body, culture them for a week so that they have a lot of the better ones, and then they inject them to your knee or hip so you don't have to get a hip or knee replacement. This is hot stuff. Except, you know what? The FDA says if you culture them for a week that they're drugs. <laughs> yeah. So the docs, you know, that are doing this work, they're just, you know, in private practice, maybe with a group. They can't afford a billion dollars to uh, develop a new drug. I didn't actually overtly say that. I pointed to it on the chart. If you, the out-of-pocket costs, the actual money that a pharmaceutical company lays down over those 15 years is about $500 million today. Okay, that means the if you count like the interest in borrowing that money or the lost opportunity cost, it's a billion dollars for a new drug. That is a lot. No doctor's office is going to afford that to do, uh, you know, get a patent or something on their pat their stem cell pr process. Even if they could, it's actually kind of hard to do that. So they're going offshore. So the only people who get these treatments are those who can afford to go offshore. This is crazy because think about. Think about the cost savings if somebody doesn't need a knee or hip replacement. It's just crazy. So, you know, this is, this is also going to be, all these things are going, going to come together and I think really hurt the FDA and make them look like uh, they're really impeding progress and I think they're going to go down. For the recording, for the recording. We want it for the recording, if you can. Uh, okay, I think uh, they, want, they want me to next, so I will. <laughs> I wondered how you would respond to the, crit the uh. critique of your perspective that I hear from a couple of MD friends who are not unsympathetic to li libertarianism, but they have a different perspective. And basically that is, they say that number one, Ivan Illich showed in his book Medical Nemesis, or at least argued and somewhat plausibly, that modern medicine is, is killing as many people as it helps, and if we completely abolished it, we would be about the same place we are now with life expectancy. <laughs> uh, so, that, uh, therefore, and they also say that the real problem with health regarding pharmaceuticals is people taking way too many. Uh, people are always asking for some new fancy pill, and 99% of the time it hurts them rather than helps them, but doctors have to give them these pills, and pharmaceutical companies want to make a lot of money. And I think there's some truth to this. All my relatives in Morocco and friends in many countries are gobbling antibiotics like candy. So uh, <laughs> Yes, I can address and, that for okay, you. Yeah, that number, number one. And number two, then, therefore, what is wrong with forcing people selling anything to tr do truth in labeling, prove that it works before you're allowed to say that it works, just like prove there's chocolate in it before you sell something. Okay, claiming well, let me, let me address your last one first. Prior to the 62 amendments, you did not have to prove that your drug worked. You just had to prove it was safe for the intended use. Now, what does that mean? Well, that meant if I was doing this liver research in prostaglandins, we could have sold the prostaglandins and said, look, we have seen that it helps animals with liver disease, so it's possible it will help people, and it's there if you want to try it. Now, I think that is a, a more proper way to go because when we had to try to do these effectiveness studies, they were so difficult to, to meet the very high standards that the FDA has that we could not do it, and so it was, nothing was available. And if you think about it for a minute, because of the placebo effect, every drug is effective. Okay, every drug's going to work in somebody. And what does it mean to be effective? Does it have to be effective in 90 out of 100 people? Or 1 out of 10? If it saves lives, is 1 out of 10 good enough? Or do you have to have 50% of the people being favorably affected? In the early 1900s, the Supreme Court ruled that efficacy was a matter of opinion because of these considerations. Now, getting back to your statement about medicine today. Yes, medicine today has been distorted by regulations. You see, the pharmaceutical industry before the 62 amendments was working in nutrition. They were the leaders in nutrition. And probably what would have happened if the free market had been allowed to work the way it should have is we would have had a combination of nutritionals where we needed them and pharmaceuticals where we needed them. But 
That was basically outlawed by the Kefauver Harris Amendment. So the only thing that could be done was to not only focus on pharmaceuticals to the exclusion of prevention, but but also to I'm, I'm going to say that the regulations actually made the drugs less safe. Why? Because now it didn't make any economic sense to take an old drug where the side effects were known and try to get a new indication for it from the FDA. In other words, if you put a drug on the market that helps someone's acne and then found out it cured cancer, um, you're not allowed to advertise it that it cures cancer until you go through the rigmarole of the FDA again. But from an economic standpoint, it's smarter for the drug company to start all over, <coughs> excuse me, with a similar drug, but where the side effects aren't known, and try to market that. So it's distorted the industry so much, and the medical industry too, because the medical industry is influenced by the pharmaceutical industry to a great extent, and because the rules are that only certain people can talk to doctors and say certain things, as I was telling you before. So the whole industry has been really distorted by these Kefauver Harris amendments. And that's how I would answer your MDs. Yes, there has been distortion, and taking away this, the Kefauver Harris amendments would take away that distortion. Uh, so I agree that uh, some of the things about the regulation, the system that we have in place is really quite flawed. Um, but you seem to have some contradiction in that it sounds like there, to you, there's not enough drugs on the, available on the market, but then most of the problems that we have are actually lifestyle problems and are actually fixed by a better lifestyle rather than more drugs like chronic diseases such as like cancer, mm -hmm. diabetes, heart disease, things like that. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out why, the, why you think that we need more drugs to treat these problems <laughs> okay. when really maybe health promotion, which you never discussed once, uh, maybe that would be a, the actual solution is health promotion instead of more right. drugs, less regulation sort of thing. Because that, that wasn't discussed at all, health promotion. Right. Well, actually, I, that's why I mentioned prevention. The fact that the 62 amendments outlawed prevention is probably their biggest, um, how can I say, the biggest uh, uh, mortality. For example, I'll, I will discuss it a little now since you brought it up. Um, one of the things, I, I told you that the, these regulations created an American thalidomide, and I want to talk about that in answer to your question, because the B vitamin, folic acid, was found in the early 1980s to prevent neural tube defects in infants. Now, many of you probably don't know what that means, but spina bifida and another, uh, many other conditions where the, the poor infant has to be institutionalized. I mean, usually they're so bad they have to be institutionalized. Um, these defects are prevented by the B vitamin folic acid, and we knew about this in the early 80s. But when the folic acid manufacturers wanted to tell young American women, be sure and take folic acid because this defect happens very early in your pregnancy when you might not even know you're pregnant, um, they were told that they would be shut down by the FDA if they did that. And then the Center for Disease Prevention started telling everybody that, and the FDA said if the folic acid manufacturers even mentioned that Center for Disease Control position, they would be shut down. And the FDA has carte blanche. That happened early in the enforcement of the amendments. So this kind of thing, um, this kind of prevention is not uh, available until many, many years after we actually know about it. So in that sense, we need more prevention. And I personally am a big vitamin taker, and so were most of my research uh, fellow researchers. The MDs, incidentally, usually drank, smoked, and were overweight and didn't take their vitamins. All the researchers who made their animals sick by taking their vitamins away were pretty religious about taking care of their lifestyle. Now, nevertheless, there are genetic conditions where that's not enough for some people and maybe they do need assistance with drugs, or if you're in an accident, or you're infected, uh, you know, you need, you do need some types of drugs. So I'm not against either of them. I think the marketplace should decide, and the individual and their physician should decide. And obviously, if we had allowed, if we had not outlawed prevention, we would have the proper mix today, I believe. And that, that's what I'm saying. Now, the reason I talk about the pharmaceutical industry is, of course, that's something I know very well. I could give an equally long lecture on prevention, 
And um, actually, um, I will suggest to you, if you want to learn more about prevention in one kind of place that you can go to, I would recommend the Life Extension Foundation, lef.org founded by a couple libertarians who have fought the FDA on a number of occasions, actually had some landmark cases, and uh, they are a vitamin manufacturer, and they also put out very scholarly articles on what's going on. I've actually written for them on occasion myself, so um, I, I, and I encourage that. I don't want to give the impression that what we need are more drugs, but what we need is a free marketplace so that the right drugs come to market. I'm going to say now that the wrong drugs are coming to market. You know, right now, manufacturers have pressure to get something that's going to sell as opposed to something that's going to cure. If they had a cure for cancer that was a one-shot deal that they could charge thousands of dollars for, they still probably wouldn't be able to recover their costs as easily as something that people have to take every day for the rest of their lives this market distortion wouldn't happen in a, in, without these amendments. And that's the kind of distortion we're getting. So I hope I've, hope I've addressed your concerns. And we can talk more afterwards, too, if you want. Hi. Uh, I, I have a comment and then a question. I'm, I'm a nurse, so I come to your lecture from that standpoint. I was curious to hear and enjoyed your lecture. But being married to a political scientist and economist, when I hear the statement about um, making things safer with regulation or, making, or having someone prove that their drug does what they say that it does, I think of how with um, the marketplace can determine whether that drug does what it says it does. That's right. And by word of mouth, like, like we want the marketplace to do with so many things that That's doesn't right. need to be regulation. That's right. In fact, the I truth will bear itself. That's out. right. In fact, you, you're making a good point that I want to elaborate on a little bit. Uh, because and like then I just, said, there's, let me just tell okay. you this other one because then I can turn okay, this off sure. and give it away. Sure. But I'd like you to comment on then have um, chemists or people who want to develop drugs gone to other countries to try to do it without these tight regulations. Yes. Okay. Well, actually, regulations um, are different in every country, but there is a movement called Codex trying to harmonize them, which translates into making them as bad as our FDA, if not worse. So, in fact, in, in some, Codex is actually trying to make um, high dose vitamins prescription items. They've done so in Germany. I think if you want over 200 milligrams of vitamin C, uh, you have to get it by prescription now. Uh, I take 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. That just gives you a little idea. Um, and as far as the marketplace uh, deciding if something works or not, in fact, studies done after the 62 amendments were passed showed that um, at most the kefauver harris amendments might have taken 10% of the drugs that were ineffective. I mean, how can I say it? They decided that there was maybe... Before the amendments were passed, the biggest number of ineffective drugs on the market that I've seen from the studies was 20%. And after the amendments, the same group said that the ineffective drugs were 10%. So obviously, for a 10% change in effectiveness before and after, we're paying this huge price. So it doesn't, it, you know, there, there might have been a little bit of uh, increase effectiveness, but not much. And the reason is the way, the way companies handle this is before the Kefauver Harris amendments, they would give the new drug to physicians and say, try it in your patients and tell us if it works. And if they came back and said, no, this stuff doesn't work, they figured it wasn't worth taking it to market. Okay. Yes, I am. So, um, so that was, uh, that's how they handled that. And I'm just, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how much time I actually have, so I'll just continue until somebody tells me it's time. <laughs> okay, we'll wrap I'm, it up. I'll try to make this one short. I heard you mention, and I totally agree, the ignorance of doctors regarding nutrition. Um, last year or the year before, after Porkfest, I, I had listened to a guy named Roderick Long, and I listened to his video about how government fixed the healthcare system, mm -hmm. and he was 
he was discussing, it was actually a booklet, he was discussing lodge practice. And I'm sort of a history geek, and I knew nothing about that. Do you think that physicians are just as ignorant of our history as they are of nutrition? And have you heard that Roderick Long video? It's a really good one. I haven't seen that video, but yes, I mean, you know, if you know how physicians are trained, um, well, I'll just give you an example. I was working with a couple transplant surgeons on an animal, and they said, why aren't you a transplant surgeon? And I said, I cannot stand on my feet and operate for 48 hours without sleep. And I was making kind of a joke, but they took it seriously because <laughs> that's kind of what happens. Doctors are so, to be a, a physician, you have to give up so much. We used to joke that the social development of MDs uh, stopped when they entered medical school. Uh, again, not to be mean to the docs, but to to emphasize how hard they have to work, how everything else gets cut out to, to do what you have to do. And it's brutal. I mean, California passed a law one year that phys hospital physicians could not work more than 80 hours a week. <laughs> so you know they were working more than that. It's, it's tough. So anyhow, I, I think I need to wrap up. So I'm, I'm going to just say thank you very much for having me. And if you have questions, I will be available afterwards for a while. So you can come up and... Continue if you need to. Thank you. Look, okay, I just want to say a big thank you to Mary Ruard. First time at Port Fest. We're very happy to have you. Honored. Thank you. See you.